All right. Well, welcome, ladies. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for joining um, us tonight for a virtual tour to Colombia's thrilling and seldom explored Wild East with George Armistead, who has recently returned from touring uh, the region. And as the saying goes, this is hot off the press. Uh, Nikki here together with Keith from Rock Jumper Birding Tours, and we are thrilled to host today's webinar. We know that many of you have been joining us faithfully every week over the last few months and are well versed on Zoom's platform. But if you're new to our webinars, there is a Q&A box at the bottom of your screen where you can send your questions and we will answer them at the end of this webinar. Our speaker today is George Armistead, a proud Philadelphian, co-founder co of uh, birdphilly.org, author of two books, Better Birding and the ABA Field Guide <laughs> to Birds of Pennsylvania. Uh, and George has guided many tours to each continent. Most importantly, he is thrilled to see travel again on the horizon. Welcome, George, and thank you for taking us to Colombia. Okay, thank you, Nikki. Yeah, great to, to be here with you guys. And yeah, it's really, really exciting to be here, actually, uh, in part because we are about to talk about a trip that I have just done, as you've mentioned. I feel like uh, a lot of the time we're, we're talking about destinations that we have done a lot here at Rock Jumper. Um, and this will be a little different. This will be a window into a country that I really love, Colombia, um, but a window into a place that I had never actually been before uh, until just a couple of weeks ago. I returned the very end of, of uh, or I left at the, at the end of February, returned St. Patty's Day, um, uh, 17th of March, and uh, got to see a couple different uh, parts of Columbia I'd not been to before. Uh, just to orient you a little bit, a couple maps here. Um, the title of this talk was mentioned Orinoquia and Amazonia. You'll see those are the Eastern sections of Panama below. And on the left is a map that shows Columbia. The red areas uh, denote areas of high uh, human population. So you can see the big cities there are really in the mountains uh, and out to the east, it gets a little more wild and woolly. Um, we begin our trip by going into the town of Yopal. And I will, I'll, I'll begin actually by asking a trivia question here to see if anybody knows the answer. Um, what bird is the Yopal Airport named for? I was pretty surprised to arrive in Yopal into the Llanos and see the airport is actually named after a pretty iconic bird. Uh, so yeah, you fly into Yopal, see the Llanos of Orinoquia, then we head uh, even further east to Inirida, which is right on the border of uh, where Orinoquia and Amazonia meet, uh, in extreme Eastern Colombia there right sort of on the Orinoco River, such that to the east is the country of Venezuela. And I'm not gonna talk about Me Too really too much in this presentation, but it's worth keeping in mind uh, that there's quite a bit of overlap between Me Too and Inirida. Uh, there are some differences in birds you see and some, a, a number of differences, but these are both places we offer trips to and a lot of the birds can be seen in Me Too as well. So let's talk, let's, let's zoom out a little bit here and talk about Columbia big picture. Uh, it is well known, right, as coffee country. And in fact, uh, UNESCO declared the coffee triangle as it's called more or less in the middle of the country there, uh, a world heritage site. All that they grow are Arabica beans and it's famous for its mild and well-balanced beans. The only place that produces more coffee is Brazil. And here's a view. Um, in the, the coffee triangle. I took this picture of my buddy John Myers and I one morning uh, when we were having breakfast out there, uh, getting ready to go look for yellow-eared parrots. 
having a nice cup of joe. Columbia is well known for being mega diverse, right? What does that mean exactly? We'll get into that. It's the world epicenter of birds. Um, if you're going to be mega diverse, it helps to have a lot of mountains like you have here in the central Andes. It's well known as a hot spot for birds. It has more species of birds than any other country in the world. The current list seems like it's always growing, getting ever closer to 2,000 birds. 958 species is the, the latest count, I believe. That represents about 20%, about a fifth of all bird species in the world. This is a blue-billed curassow, which is one of the rarest in the world. And uh, Columbia is actually home to 25 crassid species, which is involves the chachalacas, curassows, guans, more of those in Colombia than anywhere else in the world. Very good place for those. There's over 80 endemic species in Colombia, birds that are not found anywhere else. These are two uh, that you can see even just right outside of Bogota, um, the, the Bogota rail and the blue fronted star frontlet. I took these on day trips out of Bogota on my recent trip there. One of my favorite pictures of bird with birders taken by Jeff Gordon on our ABA rock jumper event a few years ago. And it is a very good place for hummingbirds. About 165 of the world's hummingbirds are found in Colombia. That is more than any other country in the world. There are new species being found all the time, including this one. Uh, very few people have seen this one yet, Dushan Brinkhuizen who's responsible for a lot of the photos in this presentation. Thank you, Deshaun, for your help with this one. Uh, includes this new Anspita, Ampita, which is has not been named yet, but they call it the Tororoi Bailador. It's found just outside the city of Cali. One of, I think it's the second or third biggest town in Bogota, one of the oldest cities in South America, over 400 years old. Uh, and they just found this new species of Ampita right there. New developments all the time. And it is not only a great place for birds, a great place for all sorts of things, uh, including orchids. More orchid species than any other country in the world uh, are known from Colombia. It is second in the world in amphibian species. Uh, and this, these are some San Lorenzo harlequin toads that uh, I saw with Roger Rodriguez on a tour to the Santa Martas a couple years ago. This is another critically endangered uh, toad found only in the Santa Marta Mountains. Second in the world in amphibians, third in the world in reptiles. Was pretty interested to find out this photo I took in the Llanos. Uh, this, the, the turtle on the left here is endemic to the Llanos, the two on the right more widespread, the yellow necked side necks. But it is a tremendous place for reptiles and for butterflies and for plants and freshwater fish. Great place for palm trees. Uh, the Candillo wax palm is the national tree. It's quite in, endangered as well. Uh, there's, there's relatively few patches left for, of it. It's the tallest palm tree in the world and it is also the host tree for most uh, yellow-eared parrot nests. It's Columbia's fourth in the world in mammal diversity. This is a Colombian spider monkey photo I took a couple years ago traveling with Rock Jumper founder Adam Riley and one of our guides Peter Kaysner. We're very lucky to see these guys, a little troop of about five of them. So almost 10% of the planet's biodiversity is found in Colombia. Why is that? Like I said before, it helps to have mountains. And one thing that's different about Colombia is that the Andes runs right all the way from Chile up through Colombia and barely into Venezuela. But when, when the Andes get to Colombia, they split into three different ranges. You can see there the Occidental, the Central, the Oriental. And between, so each of those acts as concentration areas for endemicism. And then between them are these valleys. There's the Cauca Valley, the Magdalena Valley, uh, and then on the west side is the Pacific Coast uh, where the Choco is. So these, each of these areas have in birds that are only found there. Add to that the fact that you have way up in the north there, the Santa Marta Mountains, which are completely isolated from uh, the Andes and another real home of endemism. And then out in the east, where we're headed shortly here, 
you have the Orinoco and Amazon drainages and all the birds associated with each of those. Add to that the fact that this is twice, this country is twice the size of Texas or the UK, France and Germany combined. This is a big country with a just incredible diverse landscape uh, that gives way to a lot of different um, animals and plants. And so here you'll see this, what are, I like to break it down into these bioregions. This is a little more manageable for me. Uh, we talked about the Pacific coast, which is real humid and, and rainy. There are the islands as well uh, out there, but uh, people don't think of those quite as much when they think of mainland uh, Colombia. There's the Caribbean in the north, uh, the Andes region, where, which is where most of the people live, right? And then there's the Orinoquia and the Amazonia. If you want to learn more about these, uh, before we get too far out, Where Next uh, worked with the Colombian government to produce these movies, the Birders movies. There's four different ones. There's actually another one, a longer feature, but each of these are like 10 to 15 minutes long. There's one for the Amazon. There's one for the Llanos and, and Orinoquia. There's another uh, for the Pacific Coast and the Choco. And then there's one uh, for way up north, the Santa Martas and the dry... Um, dry forest in the areas up around the Caribbean coast. Each of them well worth watching, short, amazing footage, uh, can't recommend them highly enough, easily found on YouTube. So again, just to reorient you here, this is, this is where we're going. And uh, hopefully, probably by now, somebody's figured out the Yopal question. These are, the, these are the departments. Uh, they don't have states or provinces. They have departments in Colombia. Uh, Casanare is where I was for the Llanos. That's where our tour goes. And Vichada and Wainia. If you can, you can see where Inirida is on the map there, we, we have birding sites mostly in Wainia, but also a few in Vichada. But before we go, I thought you all might be interested uh, and perhaps amused to see what it was like traveling there, right? We, we had a number of reasons for traveling, which I'm happy to, to get into. It was very interesting to be traveling, uh, you know, sort of hopefully what we see is the end of this pandemic. Um, and in Colombia, hopefully my Colombian friends will not hate me for showing this, but I thought it was too interesting to not share. They have a new app, right? There's an app for everything. Now there's an app uh, for, that gets you ready to go through immigration in Colombia. In that app, you have to choose a profession. And there's a variety of professions that you can choose from, some of which, you know, make a lot of sense, right? There's agricultural engineer, there's astrophysicist, astronomer you see there as well, entomologist, right? Microbiologist, a lot of science here I was happy to see. Guide, well, that tells you something about tourism in Colombia. And, uh, and the Colombian government has been very dedicated to, to increasing tourism, specifically ecotourism and avatourism. Um, so it was good to see that on there. Then there's some really specific ones. Poet. If you're a poet, they have this for you as a profession. Beekeeper. I was really surprised to see beekeeper here. I thought that was rather specific as well. Uh, even as somebody who is a bird tour leader, I, I thought this one was pretty specific. I wonder how many people out there uh, are beekeepers or Republic presidents. Um, thought that was interesting. This one, I'm not sure exactly what it is, uh, but it was good to know that the vegetable ivory craftsmen were well represented here. Worker peon, I wondered if this was sort of like an, you know, under the cuff uh, shot at those of us in the travel or service industry over the last year and a half. That's, that's kind of how it's felt, but uh, that was there. Bullfighter. Bullfighter was an interesting one. Again, I wonder how many bullfighters there are in the world. Urban healer. Um, yeah, that, that's, that's, I feel like I know some people that might describe themselves as urban healers. Savior was pretty bold. I, I considered choosing Savior myself, but it just seemed uh, not quite me. So I settled on wild man. I went for wild man. That was my profession to enter Colombia. So let's go there, shall we? We go to the Llanos, uh, which, yeah, you can pronounce it Janos or Llanos. 
it is this purple region here that is bounded to the west um, by the Andes, to the north by the coastal range of Venezuela, and uh, to the south by the Tapuis of the Guianan Shield. You can sort of see the topography there cropping up, which are the Tapuis, which are really cool. Hope we can get back to, to Venezuela someday because the Tapuis there and the Llanos of Venezuela are absolutely amazing place. Um, this was actually my this was my fourth, I think, trip to the Llanos. I'd done three trips to the Llanos in Venezuela. This was my first to the Colombian Llanos, and it was my first to Amazonia as well uh, when we got there later on. So yeah, you can see the Llanos, it drains into the Orinoco, which is the fourth largest river in the world in terms of its water discharge by volume. And this is kind of what it looks like. It's a seasonal floodplain. We went in February, February, March, which is sort of the end of the dry season. Um, people go there frequently, kind of starting like November uh, through March, even into April sometimes. Uh, that's the drier season there. I kind of like February, March because uh, in theory, the, it should be getting drier and drier and drier and these pockets of water sort of shrink down and stuff gets really concentrated there. So it's easier to find the, the mammals and uh, the birds because everything's kind of packed into these these areas and then when the wet season hits it really floods and uh, it's a different story there all together uh, you get around a lot more by boat and uh, it's it's just very different it's a, it's dramatic uh, how much both this area the Llanos and in year that change from the wet season to the dry season like meters of water <laughs> come and go uh, so it's quite dramatic and it's a big area for cattle ranching, gas and oil, and for rice and corn. A lot of cattle ranching, uh, which uh, fortunately is actually, helps preserve a lot of birding habitat, a lot of uh, area for, for wildlife. And you can see sort of what they call gallery forest in the background, but a lot of this is sort of open savanna. Uh, they have the, the, the breed of cattle there is this Zebu Brahmin cattle you see all over the place that are quite resistant to disease and also tolerate the heat a lot more than many other breeds of cattle. Uh, they're from Asia originally. And it is a very good place for the world's largest rodent. They call it there the, in Colombia the Chiwire or Chiwiru, uh, the Capybara which I always say it looks sort of like if you crossed a moose and a guinea pig, squished them together, you end up with something that looks like a capybara. And you see dozens, if not hundreds of them uh, in the Llanos. The Llanos is a very good place for capybara. Uh, they are popularly eaten in some places during Lent when the people are giving up meat otherwise. Um, and different people seem to say different things about uh, uh, eating capybara. Some people say it's quite flavorful. Others, others say you have to tr basically treat it with so much stuff that you can't recognize the taste in order for it to really be edible. This is my fiance, Kristen, looking at a bunch of capybara in the Llanos there. Uh, we did this first leg to the Llanos together uh, and then Kristen went, uh, flew home. She is a nurse been treating a lot of COVID patients for the last few months. So this was quite a nice break for her. And as somebody uh, who has <laughs> made my living in travel, uh, it, was, it was very nice for me as well to get away and see scenes like this. This is uh, beautiful. Uh, one of the pretty scenes we saw. I, I love to see habarus anytime, you know, it's a real treat to see those giant storks. Um, and to see these big flocks of water birds. The front half of your field guide is well represented uh, in the Llanos. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of big flocks of, of uh, storks and waterfowl and a good place for raptors. Here you can see some scarlet ibis taking off. I think there's a few roseate spoonbills, great egrets, big flocks of wood storks. And in this particular site, I think we saw over 30 of these habaru. Now, a lot of there's some debate as to how you pronounce this bird's name. Some people say jabaru, which I think is fine. Some people say habaru. That's just kind of how I pronounce it. I'm not exactly sure I'm doing it correctly. Supposedly, it comes from a Guarani word that means swollen neck, uh, which you can see is, is on display with these birds. 
a, a, an incredible bird and really, really massive, huge, tall bird. And uh, it's wonderful to see them so common as they are in the Llanos. Another really spectacular thing, you know, all, all these wetland areas just really teem with birds. And you can see here a nice big flock of Oriole blackbirds. These were taken by my colleague here at Rock Jumper, Lev Frid, who captured this flock beautifully. And in the background, you can see a bunch of these scarlet ibis. And this is a fairly regular scene in the Anos, especially I think a little, this looks like it's pretty wet when he was there. And you do see lots of waterfowl, which they, the, the waterfowl flocks are mostly made up of whistling ducks. And there's a couple different kinds you can get there. Here, this image is another one by Lev, I believe is, is pretty much all black bellied whistling ducks, but you can see uh, fulvous whistling ducks and white faced whistling ducks also. But there's even other species of ducks you see there, blue wing teal, Brazilian teal, uh, and you can, you can get lucky. I was pretty sure I had a northern shoveler actually uh, at, at this site where we were in Llanos, uh, but it kind of got away from me, which would be sort of a good bird for there. Uh, probably more regular than people think. The river itself uh, there is, this is the Aripuro River. And we, one of the things you can do is take a nice boat ride along the Aripuro, which is quite good for herons and, uh, and for a few more ducks and for these large build terns, which uh, remind us a lot of skimmers in their appearance. They look like black skimmers, which are present there also in their structure. They kind of look like skimmers, but vocally they sound a lot more like a laughing gull. And it is a very good place for herons as well, like those cattle egrets and whistling heron. Uh, there was days where we had over 20 his whistling herons there in the Anos, and uh, they are a beautiful heron. There's two different populations. There's one in the north in the Anos, north of most of Amazonia, and then one in the south from Bolivia on down through Paraguay and northern Argentina. Uh, the one in the Anos, I think it averages a little smaller if I remember, but it's, it's paler overall, uh, quite a handsome bird. And, uh, and we see quite a few of those when we visit the Llanos. I remember in Venezuela, one of my local guides told me it was called Pintacara because they said it looked like it had made its, painted up its face. Um, but I've never seen a reference to that otherwise. So I don't know if that was like a local thing that he came up with or if that actually has more widespread usage. Hopefully some of my Colombian friends might be able to tell me. Another heron we see is the Garza Morena. Uh, as they call it there, the Kakoi heron, which looks a lot like a great blue heron or maybe a gray heron for those of you in Europe, but it's quite large, I think, compared to gray heron at least, uh, and a really handsome bird, especially when they have these nuptial plumes coming off the back and chest, and I think we were there at a good time for them because they all looked quite handsome. Very good place for ibis, scarlet ibis, you know, sort of retina scalding birds. Here they are with uh, an assortment of looks like white ibis perhaps and, and egrets as well. Uh, the Yanis is a good place for ibis. We see uh, good numbers of scarlets. Also bare-faced ibis is, is quite regular. See those daily in the area. Buff-necked ibis, which we took to calling buff-necked uh, just because it seemed appropriate or inappropriate. Uh, and they kind of stalk the grounds of the lodge there and are seen pretty widely really throughout the Llanos. And this is a real special one. Nice photo here by Lev of a sharp-tailed ibis. And this is basically a Llanos specialty. This is a bird that's essentially really only seen in the Llanos, a little bit in the Guianan Shield further east uh, as well. But I think it is a real Llanos bird and quite a handsome ibis that makes uh, some funky sounds as well. They're real vocal, which is cool to hear, and they're quite common as well. Some of the common songbirds involve uh, birds like this masked cardinal, uh, which is actually not a cardinal at all, but a tanager, and, uh, and a very handsome one. You see them just in all sorts of different areas. Most folks that have been to the Neotropics will recognize this one. The blue-gray tanager is a really pretty one, uh, and uh, our folks at the lodge there hung some bananas for us so that these guys, they came in real close. And uh, like a number of birds there, they're, they're pretty habituated to people. Um, they're wild, uh, but they are just sort of used to people not being threats and, and they come in close. Now this is not common anymore. Uh, this is a, an Orinoco crocodile. This is a photo Lev took uh, from, from the Colombian Llanos. This looks like a biggie. Um, this is a critically endangered animal now. 
super rare. These are a couple photos. Unfortunately, they're, they don't, the only ones copies I have now, I pulled these off Facebook from 2009. This was a, during a photo tour I did to the, the uh, Venezuelan Llanos back in 2009. And uh, I'm not sure where the rest of those photos are now. But uh, this is a beautiful Orinoco crocodile from Hato Cedral and a green anaconda. We, we didn't see either of those on this recent trip, although there is a place apparently where you can go see Orinoco crocodile. And uh, green anacondas are a real hit or miss. Uh, you can get those. Uh, some, the time of year we, was, we were there was quite good. They had one the day before we got there. We went back and, and looked for it and did not see it. The way that you look for it actually is pretty interesting. Uh, if those, some of you will have experienced this, no doubt, but you go into these wet areas and the, the guides, they go around with sticks and kind of poke them into places and they can tell uh, if there's an anaconda down in, in the water there, uh, to turn, you know, they kind of feel for it with the stick. And uh, we hit a number of spots like this looking for anacondas, came up empty this time. It seems like you kind of have a 50-50 shot. Uh, some groups get them quite easily the first day. Other groups spend three or four days and never do get one. One of the things just about everybody sees though is this strange beast. The horned screamer is a yard bird. It's, an, it's another one of these birds that's sort of habituated to people um, at this particular spot in the Llanos. Uh, they walk around like yard birds and they've got this weird, you know, feather growth off the top of the head, this sort of filamentous horned. So this one is the horn screamer. There's three species of screamer in the world. Uh, this one is pretty widespread in Northern South America. It does pretty well. You can see they have really, they're just a weird looking bird, right? They got, crazy legs and that these big feet and they actually it takes them a while to get going they can fly around a bit uh, and they, they go up and land on big trees but then they go around looking for big insects and lizards and stuff they have the outer layer of their skin i think it's like the, the outermost uh, quarter you know maybe a couple centimeters is real spongy and full of air sacs uh, so they have this, th these like kind of bubble-like skin that if you press it, it actually makes sort of a hissing sound. It's really strange. And, you know, as strange as these birds uh, appear, they are actually related to, they're most closely related to ducks and geese. Um, I think, I think maybe spur-winged goose or magpie goose is their closest relative. I can't remember which of those oddball uh, geese, but uh, it is a very strange bird. And it's actually one they keep sort of like a, I don't want to say a pet because they're wild animals, but they, they make these really deep sort of swallowing sounds. It sounds like they're like, I don't know, gulping down pudding or, or something. Uh, and, and you can hear it for miles away. And they will actually act sort of as sentinels or guard dogs if for, at some of these big ranches, the autos, as they call them there. And so... Um, if, if you have, you know, an interloper or, or a trespasser coming in, sometimes birds like this horned screamer or the southern lapwing will make a ton of noise and, and work well as guard dogs. Here we have a Colombian red howler. We saw several troops of these during our visit to the Llanos, pretty widespread throughout much of Latin America or uh, throughout much of Colombia, uh, and they are Quite handsome. This was a little guy. It was a little more bold. Pale tip tarantulate. I always love the little tiny flycatchers. I cannot uh, always identify them so easily, but the pale tip tarantulate is a nice, handsome one, easy to identify, and they come pretty close too. So you can get some good pictures of them. Another real stunner found really throughout much of eastern Colombia is wire-tailed mannequin. Uh, we came across this guy who was who was at his perch, uh, hoping a female might come by. Also common. The yellow rumped cacique. Um, they, these guys are all over the place in the Llanos and, and even uh, further out east. They make a lot of noise. They nest in colonies real conspicuously with uh, some sort of like the, the crested oropendula, which is another real common bird uh, throughout the Llanos and, and also nest in colonies that are very conspicuous. For the family listers, people that are trying to see all the bird families in the world, there's some cool ones in this region, including the sun bittern, uh, which a lot of folks may have seen in Central America, but I've never personally been any place that they are so numerous 
as the Llanos. There are some days when you can see a dozen, two dozen, or even more sometimes. Uh, they can just be really, really abundant. So this is a, a special monotypic uh, bird family, the sun bittern, always a treat to see. And if they fly you'll, or spread their wings, you'll see they have a dramatic um, wing pattern. This is the answer to the trivia question before, uh, if I'm not mistaken, the double-striped thick knee, El Alcaravan, is the name of the airport in Yopal. And uh, I had thought that that was the name of the southern lapwing, um, but I think it is actually this double-striped thick knee. Uh, so these are actually birds that are active during the day, but even more so at night, and uh, they go after insects and, and lizards and stuff on the ground. And uh, yeah, they're pretty pretty regular feature throughout the Llanos. We found several pairs. One that obviously had a nest or young someplace. Sometimes they put their little babies right on a cow pie, and it's amazing how uh, you know they'll be on this little dried up cow pie, and they completely blend in. You can never see them. On the River Ariporo, we had some more of these uh, side neck turtles, and the the white winged swallow is a common feature really throughout the waterways of South America or of, of Eastern Colombia and much of South America. One of my favorite birds and was the feature right on the on the intro slide is the Orinoco goose. Uh, my trips to the Venezuelan Llanos, I think I saw a couple pairs here and there of Orinoco geese in Colombia. I was really pleased and startled to see lots, uh, sometimes dozens, sometimes even triple figures of these birds. And I gather there's places in Colombia where you can see even uh, hundreds, many hundreds of these birds. Uh, it's a near threatened species. And I think there's only one other species in the genus. And I just thought they were so cool. Uh, they're, they're all around the riverbanks. And apparently they, they don't suffer that much uh, from hunting because apparently people think they don't taste good. I'm not sure that's really true or not, but it's a good legend uh, to have going about you if you're a waterfowl. Uh, and we saw lots and lots of these guys, which is, I never get tired of them, especially the ones that are out there with their little, their little youngsters, which are just absurdly cute, sort of like little baby whistling ducks, but I think even cuter in my opinion. Uh, so a, a very nice bird and a great feature of Orinokia. Another common bird, the violaceous jay. You hear these a lot more than you see them. There's, it seems like every time you venture outside, there's one sounding off someplace. Uh, and it can actually be a little tricky to get a good view, but eventually after a few days there, you'll surely get some and you can see they're quite handsome. I mentioned it was a good place for raptors, the Llanos. And here you can see this Aplomato falcon came in like a bat out of hell. We were wondering what the heck was going on. This thing came in and all of a sudden it had seen this thing, this great black hawk. And I was too stunned and startled to capture that interaction on film, unfortunately, but we had a pair of Aplomato falcons diving on this uh, great black hawk. And the great black hawk actually had a nest uh, not too far away. And suffice it to say, uh, he had his hands full there for a bit, uh, but after a minute or so, things settled down and they both went their separate ways, but quite a dramatic thing to see. Another monotypic bird family, is the black-capped Donacobius. Uh, for a while, I think they thought these were in the Wren family, and then I think they thought they were in the Babblers, and they figured out that they're in their own family, and they make some really cool sounds, some cool duetting songs, and you can kind of see on this photo, there's some yellow-orange uh, skin on the sides of their neck there, and those kind of inflate when they start singing. It's quite dramatic. Another Janos specialty, the pale-headed Jacamar, one of my favorite birds, uh, Kristen had to suffer me, through me uh, taking about a thousand plus photos of these in an hour or so. Um, I wish I had done even better than I did with them, but I was pleased to just, we had a nest right there outside the lodge. Uh, this is another bird that compared to the Venezuelan Llanos, I was surprised how numerous they were along the river, uh, the Rio Arapuro, um, and they were nesting right in the riverbank just below the lodge there. Absurdly cute, they're only, you know, about this big or so. And uh, yeah, they just look so kind of disagreeable and fussy all the time uh, that I just couldn't get enough of these guys. And they were snagging some dragonflies and bees and horseflies. They had young in that nest and they just were, they were constantly on the move hunting and feeding. Also cool to see these red-footed tortoise. They get out in the morning, you, you see them headed to the river to drink. 
And so you kind of see them move, moving to and from their burrows pretty regularly in the gallery forest that hugs the river there. Also, if you're lucky, can see uh, the, uh, the jaguar. I mean, this is, we did not see this. This is one of Lev's photos. Animal, I still want to see. They've got camera traps up now. They're getting better and better at finding those. But uh, it's, uh, it's still a tough one to see. But I think hopefully in the next year or so time, uh, we'll, we'll see more. But these are Lev's photos from uh, the Juan Salito Lodge there where we go in, uh, in, in the Llanos. Did see this one. This was one of the real highlights and kind of finishing off with the Llanos here with this guy. This king vulture uh, was sitting on this rather tired looking zebu cow. I'm joking, of course, the cow had passed, but uh, much to the glee of these vultures, uh, it was pretty dramatic to see this king vulture. We saw king vulture actually perched or on the ground, I think four different instances on this trip. I think before that, I'm not sure I'd actually ever seen one perched on my trips to the tropics. Seen plenty of them in the air but never seen them on the ground that I can recall. So it was neat to see this one. So now we head, actually head back to Bogota and then take a short flight uh, to Iniri them, all the way out east, pretty much as far east as you can go in Colombia. This is kind of what it looks like. And again, this is an area that I had never been to and still relatively few birders have been to, uh, but it is a spectacular birding site and one that I look forward to going to again and again. Um, it is pretty close to Venezuela, so the town has actually blown up a bit. Um, it's a lot of people coming across the border from Venezuela. I think it went from being about 200,000 people three years ago to now about 400,000 people. This is actually the town of Pauhil, which is just south of Iniri, though. It's an indigenous community. Pauhil actually means cassowary. So it's another place that's named after a bird. Birds feature very strongly in seems like every culture of Colombia, which is one of the things I really love about Colombia. And you can see most people get around by these, these canoes. Um, and uh, one of the things we were fortunate is that the Colombian government, there's so many indigenous communities in and around in Erie, though, they had actually, they were all vaccinated. By the time we got there, everybody was vaccinated. So we were actually this super isolated town, pretty small town out in the middle of nowhere. Uh, so we felt we were actually about as safe a place as you can be. Uh, so th this is kind of what it looks like. This is the Rio Inirida. And it is, the area is referred to as the fluvial star. Uh, this is, according to UNESCO, the third most important river system in the world. It's a confluence of a bunch of rivers, including the Inirida River, the Guaviare River, uh, and these flow along with a couple others from there shortly out into the Orinoco, the mighty Orinoco River. Um, and it is also a transitional area, but as I mentioned before, this kind of rests at the edge. You can see on the map there where it is in the east, it's right about where the Orinoquia and the Amazonia areas meet. So it's just incredibly diverse place. When you're not getting around by boat, you get around by tuk-tuk. And of course, we ventured all the way, me and Kristen had to fly home for this leg, but my buddy Todd joined me and we met just by chance. We ended up running into, into our friends, Eliana and Mark Kramer. And Eliana took this shot, which was actually helpful to show the, uh, the tuk-tuks, which is how you often get around if you're in fairly small groups there. But we couldn't believe our luck to you know, go all the way into the middle of nowhere uh, and run into our friends there it was a real treat. So we enjoyed a couple nice meals together and, and uh, a little bit of rum too, as we overlapped uh, one or two nights there. So that was tremendous fun. And you can see here the white sand on the ground, right? The white sand is a big part of uh, birding in Irida. There's a whole bunch of birds that, you know, it's pretty nutrient poor soil. So it actually, uh, it, it, it gives rise to limited plant communi communities and birds end up specializing. Uh, the birds that are there end up being specialists of the white sand forests. So you get it, that's one of the other factors here is white sand forest. There's a bunch of arzia forest as well, seasonally flooded forest, and this Guiana and shield influence that comes over from further east, all mixing together to create this real uh, interesting confluence of birds. Uh, this is a white sand savanna before we walk out into the forest. Uh, and you can see this, this whole area would, in the wet season, would be under probably maybe two meters of water, something like that. Shows you how, what a dramatic change there is from season to season. We're here again at the end of the dry season. Some of the cool birds you see uh, in the area include the yellow-crowned mannequin, 
uh, the green-tailed golden throat. These are pics uh, by Adam Riley, uh, who shared a nice bunch of photos actually from the Me Too area. Uh, these are white sand specialists and some of the key birds we were looking for. One of my favorites was this uh, black mannequin, which is another uh, white sand bird. And uh, there's only two birds in the genus, Xenopipo, which basically means strange mannequin. Uh, and this can be a little bit of a tricky one. Uh, you hear enough of them. I think we heard five or six of them at one spot, but finally laying eyes and actually getting a decent picture was a real thrill. That was a neat one. My first day in Aniri though, I think my, my Colombian friends were laughing at me because we were going along a tuk-tuk and I saw like a little group of these swallowing puffbirds. And I'd never been to Amazonia before and I just about lost my mind. I was like, swallowing puffbird, swallowing puffbird. I was going crazy. And of course, this is one of the most common birds there. You see them any place there's open space and in a, in a, in a bank nearby, um, you see these swallowing puffbirds. And they are quite, as puffbirds go, they're pretty strange. They, they're uh, arboreal insectivores or aerial insectivores rather. Uh, and they make their nest in burrows on the ground or in banks. And they actually, we saw several pairs that uh, actually groups, I should say, that appeared to be engaged in cooperative breeding. Uh, all of this just seemed utterly strange to me. So despite being a very common bird, it was one I was quite thrilled to see. I joked that this tour should be called Guacamayas and Jacamars, uh, which means, you know, macaws and jacamars. There's so many um, macaws, well, you know, four species or so, and, uh, and about five or so species of jacamars. But it's just dramatic to see these huge parrots flying around like these scarlet macaws, which you see uh, pretty much daily. And if you're lucky, you see the red and green, which are even bigger than these guys, blue and yellows. Um, I think we said we had red-bellied macaws and chestnut front of macaws. So it's a good place for macaws. If you like big showy parrots, these guys are there. Uh, and one of the common birds of the forest is the white crowned mannequin. Uh, this is one of Adam's shots and a, a beautiful view of this little white crowned mannequin. A couple kinds of toucans there, um, uh, including the, this white throated, which is most confiding in, in one of the indigenous villages there. Black-headed parrots, quite common. In the forest areas, you hear a lot of these gilded barbets. Uh, seldom do you see them as well as, as Dushan Brinkheisen has, has captured them here, but uh, you do, we saw a few and, uh, and you hear them every day. You hear gilded bar, barbets in the forest there. It's a, it's a nice one to hear. Spotted puffbird is another one of the real treats uh, of the area. It's a good place for Pompadour Katinga. Um, I think we actually saw like five females and one male, but I know other friends that have been there and seen three or four males all sitting up together. Uh, so it can be kind of a tricky bird elsewhere. This is a pretty good place to see it, Pompadour Katinga. Capped heron is along the river in small numbers, uh, but dramatic when you do see them. And again, this is how we got around these big long canoes. Um, if you like traveling by boat and you like birding on foot, that's those, that's kind of our primary way of being on, in this area is uh, it's a little bit more, you have to have a little more energy, a little more, uh, be a little more expedition type birder uh, because a lot is on foot or by these canoes, um, which I find quite exciting. Um, and you can see this is the, this is one of the areas where you board the canoes uh, and you can kind of see Rogers on the right there the water gets up during the wet season about as high as where his feet are now. Uh, and you can, you can see, I mean, it's dramatic, the change in water levels. Uh, but this is, this is our primary uh, mode of travel along the Rio Inirida. And it's quite a pleasant way to bird, um, where the picture on the right is, is, is Todd with Roger. Uh, we had our only Orinoco piculates at this spot and a dramatic band-tailed nightjar uh, scene there right at dusk. Um, yeah, just pretty, pretty place to bird, bird the ed edge of the river. Still wonderful wilderness all around. I feel like this is a, a, a not, uh, an unfair name for really a cute little bird, the drab water tyrant. You see those around edges of, uh, of the rivers and some of the sandbars, really enjoyed them. One of the common voices of the forest, the slender footed tarantula, cute little things. Good place for ant shrikes, like the black crested ant shrike. This guy came out and really spread his crest for us. 
Anybody wants to venture a name on this piculate? Been told by some it was golden spangled, others that it's Lafresnais. I've sort of given up trying to figure it out. Apparently they hybridize quite a bit, so not necessarily easy, but still very, very cute. I mean, this thing's only a few inches long, little tiny woodpecker, very cool. Collared puffbird, one of the special puffbirds you see in the region. And this was probably my favorite of the toucans we saw, this ivory-billed arasari. Um, I, you know, like I say, it was my first time to Amazonia, hadn't really seen uh, a lot of these birds before. I think about a third of the birds we saw in Neneri that were actually new birds for me. And, uh, and this was one I was really pleased to see. Little Cuckoo, actually good place. We saw several. The world's smallest passerine, short-tailed pygmy tyrant. Uh, cute little guys, saw them in a couple places. You hear them more often than you see them. Uh, this is a good photo of one by Duchan, tough bird to get a uh, to get a good photo of. They're so tiny and they hang up in the canopy. This is one of Adams of the turquoise tanagers. We did see a handful of these. Tangara mexicana, despite the fact uh, it has never been found anywhere close to Mexico. It's an entirely South American bird. Opal rumped tanager, another real handsome one. It's possible there. Paradise tanager, one of the great Amazonian tanagers. Uh, this one by Adam. And if you like ant things, which I think most birders do, right? All of us hope to encounter an ant swarm. And I know Eliana, she, we, we left, she continued on. Her and Mark encountered a nice ant swarm where they had black spotted bear eye, uh, which is a real tricky bird. Uh, but we did have things like a merry uh, warbling ant wren and also uh, Cherry's ant wren we saw uh, several times. Cute little tiny things. This is one of those birds, you know, you see it on the list and you don't really realize how much you're going to enjoy it until you actually see it. Dot-backed ant bird. It's a really smart bird, really handsome. We we're very pleased to see this. Black bush bird was one of the big targets for me. This is one I really wanted to see. They're, they, they, you know, they got this recurved bill. They hang around in dark places. Uh, this is the male uh, by Dushan from Me Too area. This is my photo of a female from Inirida, and they're just, they kind of act like woodpeckers a little bit, just real strange ant birds and tough to see. You can hear them, but they're retiring. So I was very, very pleased to see this one. Inirida is quite a good place for them. Here we are taking a break on the trail. Um, could you could use a little more seating probably out there. Uh, I'm e-birding, Todd's contemplating life, and uh, Danielle is, is reading up on some flycatcher that we were struggling with. Some good mammals in the area like the common squirrel monkey. Saw a number of these guys. Good leapers. This is one of the kind of range restricted animals you have a chance to see, the colored titi. Um, and it's just fun. And one of the things that's fun is if you see a titi monkey, you get to say titi monkey. Uh, it's very fun to say titi. Uh, so we saw these a few times and it was uh, a thrill each time. And uh, they, they really need big chunks of primary forest. Uh, so uh, it's it, if you see one, you know you're in a pretty good wild place. Good place for butterflies. Um, don't know what all these are. The one on the right, some kind of heliconid. The one on the left is a dagger wing and, and uh, or the lower left is the dagger wing. The upper one is an Isabella's long wing. Uh, I learned these by putting them into iNaturalist. One of the favorite things that we really enjoyed was the sandbar islands of the these rivers. Um, I knew that they were going to be there, but I hadn't really expected just how cool they were going to be. And uh, and this the first one we went to, this was the scene. It had just rained. It was starting to clear up. You hit these white sand sandbars. Our guide Daniel, you know, right away spotted some buff-breasted sandpipers. Uh, he was looking. Him and Roger here they are looking at some horn screamers, which started sounding off. In the back, you got some some black vultures hanging out, and it, it's just cool. You're you know after being in the forest the whole time, it's dark, it's difficult birding, it's difficult photography sometimes. Uh, to be out in the sandbar and have it still be full of birds and really cool birds, uh, I could have just visited those sandbars all week and been happy doing that. Um, really enjoyed that. Good place to see the pied lapwing, which is quite a widespread bird in South America, but man, they are handsome. And you can see in these photos, they've got little spurs on the corner of the wings. Presumably they 
use those uh, in duking it out for for territories, I guess. Not exactly sure, but very handsome bird. Another one I really wanted to see prior to the trip was sand colored nighthawk uh, and was very pleased to have several big groups of them hunting at night. And then we found this one day roosting as well. And I mentioned the buff breasted sandpiper. Really a thrill to see any place, anytime. Hard bird to see here at home. And to see one, um, you know, we got there to that island and Daniel's like, he, he knew I didn't know all the birds of the forest, but he knew that I would know the waders. And he said, George, what's this one? And I was like, oh, wow, buff breasted sandpiper. And there's a nice little group of them out there. And they put on such a nice show for us. And, you know, you think about this bird's journey, you know, wintering in the pampas of Argentina or maybe the Beni of Bolivia, and then migrating all the way up to the high, high Arctic to nest in the lower right, you can see the underwing of one of these ones that went winging past us. And they show that, they, they lift their wing to show their armpit basically uh, in, in display when they're in the high Arctic up there. And uh, I've seen a few juveniles here and there trickling down the East Coast over the years, but to see an adult getting on its way north in the middle of remote Columbia was actually one of the biggest thrills of the trip. Uh, we saw quite a few and they were quite confiding. And after one of our visits, here we are on the Orinoco River, we, uh, we actually ended up having some boat problems. So uh, these resolved themselves easily enough, but here you've got Todd and Roger relaxing uh, on the Orinoco. Uh, to their backs would be uh, Venezuela, and then on the other side is Colombia. And this was a great birding spot as well. We saw a bunch of good things, including on the way here, my most wanted mammal of the trip, the giant river otter. We saw this duo, we were cruising along, spotted them, and ended up being able to approach them. They were sort of closer to the Venezuela side on some rocks and got some really nice views. So that was nice. Another close up here. Some of the, I'll finish off here. We're getting close to the end anyway of, and show some of the, the, uh, the, the highlight birds like rose-breasted chat, a cardinalid actually, they didn't really know what this thing was. There's only, I think two other species in the genus Granatellus. This was a real special one. Yellow-green grosbeak showed in the savannas, the white sand savannas, that was a treat. Another good bird for the area. And this real weird seed eater, the white-naped seed eater, got a huge honking bill. It's now they put it back in the genus Sporophyllo like the other seed eaters, but man, it just seemed different to me. Um, and that was another real highlight. We got that our last day there. And then there's this ant shrike, this new ant shrike potentially. People aren't sure if it's the same thing as chestnut backed ant shrike, which is found much further south. Uh, as of now, they're, they're still doing some research. Uh, I think Andres Cuervo and the team there in Bogota are doing the genetic analysis now. This is what a chestnut backed ant shrike looks like elsewhere, one of Duchamp's photos. And this is one I took of the one in Inirida. You can see the one in Inirida is quite a bit darker. Um, so they, they don't look exactly the same, at least throughout the range. Um, and here's the range map of chestnut-backed ant shrike. Uh, you can see all those ones in the south, pretty much the other side of the Amazon. And then that, there's somebody that seabirded it uh, up there in Colombia in Inirida as chestnut-backed. But it's not clear yet exactly if this is a new species or maybe a subspecies and range extension of the chestnut-backed ant shrike. Um, pretty cool regardless. Bronzy jacamar, as I mentioned, good place for jacamars. We see paradise, brown jacamar, white-eared as possible. This is one of the other real specialties, the Orinoco softtail, still relatively little known. How's that for range restricted? Basically in Irida and just the other side of the river uh, in Venezuela, about the only place you can see it. Uh, and this was a good photo of one by my buddy Todd, who was with us. Uh, so this is one of the real special birds of the Inirida the area. Though. Another one that is Tricky. It's found elsewhere, um, you know, throughout the Guion and Shield, but man, it's a tricky bird. We did not get it on the first day we tried for it. Finally, we had one come in the last day and we got real nice views. They make this incredible sound. If you've never heard what a capuchin bird sounds like, you should, you should Google it, listen to it on the Macaulay Library or, or Xenocanto or see if you can find a video. Such a crazy bird. It's in the Katinga family, like crow sized, big bird. Totally strange looking thing, uh, it was very fun to see. And one last experience here, I know we're, we're coming up on an hour now, so I'm trying to, to get these last few slides in. Uh, one of the real highlights of this trip was visiting the Cerros de Mavicure. We arrived at dusk, 
This photo does not do it justice. I was just out of my mind at what an otherworldly and beautiful scene this was. These are sort of the, some of the, the westernmost tapuis of the Gion and Shield, and it's pretty dramatic. Uh, and I think Roger took this shot of me looking, uh, I don't know, crazy, but it was, it was a dramatic place. Pretty cool that I think the, the sunset matches my uh, life preserver there. Neat spot. We spent the night there uh, in the Hymex. This is not something we do on tour necessarily, but we would definitely visit the area. Um, but we slept in hammocks in outdoor area. Pretty neat. And uh, this is the scene when you wake up in the morning, you see um, a lot of birds, you know, just in this area. Uh, and then we decided we were going to try to hike up the smallest one, which is something folks do there at times. And, uh, and you can see it's a steep hike. Uh, some of you that might have seen this video of this of me finishing this hike on my social media, I've taken quite a beating from friends because I look visibly exhausted and soaked in sweat. Um, it was quite an endeavor. Uh, this is the first leg of it. And, and even from there, you end up getting some great views. You can see just how steep it is. Uh, a dramatic, dramatic place. Just looks like something out of Jurassic Park or a movie. It's hard to believe this place exists. And you can see just how beautiful and rich the forest looks uh, beyond and below it. Uh, really impressive area. We did find one snake along this hike called a chicken snake, cute little harmless guy. Um, that was cool. And one of the real highlights was seeing this orange-breasted falcon up there. You know, a, a basically kind of a tropical peregrine falcon. We watched this thing kind of turn a corner. He was sitting there for quite a while. Watched him for 10 or 15 minutes. Uh, he, she seemed perfectly happy until pooped and took off. And we just watched as it went away, watching in the binoculars, just rocketing dead away in a line over the forest. Suddenly realized there was a roadside hawk that had, had gotten up and was taking its first flight of the day. And this orange-breasted falcon was not going to abide that. And it was pretty funny to see the moment the roadside hawk caught sight of the orange-breasted falcon rocketing towards it, and he just dropped like a stone, wanted no part of that falcon. And then the falcon headed back and did a couple of loops around the mountain, and it was pretty dramatic. And again, this is the, this is the view, uh, a beautiful place. There's three of them. The biggest one is called Pajarito, little bird. Uh, the, the middle one there is Mono for monkey. And then the left one, which we ended up uh, uh, um, ascending, is, is called Mavecure. And collectively, these are known as the Cerros de Mavecure. Quite a view uh, and definitely a, a real, real highlight of the trip. So I want to finish up by thanking everybody. Thanks to my team, especially at Rock Jumper, Keith, Nikki, Clayton, and Adam. Quite a year plus we have had uh, lots of challenges. Uh, and, and hopefully lots of good times to come as well. Special thanks to Louisa, Angela, Roger. Every trip I've been to Columbia, uh, Roger and I have been fortunate enough to travel together. It's been always fun. Chris Bell at the Birders Show, uh, very helpful. And Danielle Camilo Orujuela Duquara. I think I pronounced all of that correctly. Thank you, Danielle. Uh, Diego and Mr. Myers, much obliged. Thanks to everybody who sent me some photos, uh, especially Dushan and Lev. I used a lot of your guys' stuff. Thanks a lot. And also thanks to Kari Papa. And yeah, we got a bunch of Columbia trips coming up. This trip I mentioned to Inira that can be combined with a five-day Llanos extension. Uh, that's coming up on in February next year. Um, so if you want to know more about that, let us know. Adam Wallane, veteran guide, been everywhere in the world, seen more birds than probably just about anybody else at Rock Jumper. Uh, he's doing this trip. Uh, there's a couple other big ones coming up. These are also sort of like in Erie, those more for the adventurous. Remote Columbia with Tuomas Sinala, that's coming up in October. There's a couple spots left on that. And arguably our, our, our craziest tour we offer, the Thousand Bird Mega Tour we, with Dushan is coming up in November. We actually, we, it's a, it's a month long trip and we try to get over a thousand species. Uh, always we're close to a thousand. Uh, sometimes we break it, sometimes we're just short, but always a marathon adventure. Uh, so check that out. I think there's only one or two spots left on that trip. That's one of our most popular. And again, those are for the more energetic folks that like high pace 
and, and good birding. Uh, for those of you that maybe want something maybe not quite so hardcore as that, I highly recommend the Santa Marta Mountains. One of my favorite trips. I'll be going back next year. Got a full trip uh, that we're going in January. Looking forward to going with my friends from Wincote Audubon. Uh, really recommend that trip as well. A great one. And uh, a couple others. Uh, Me Too, I mentioned before. We have one going in November. A lot of the same birds um, and a few different ones down there that you don't get any near the. So, uh, and, and there's a good birders movie about the area you can see. And a few other options here as well. One of my favorites we've developed recently, the Bogota, Bogota and the Coffee Triangle, Hummingbirds and Ant Pittas. Stefan, I'm very jealous you get to lead that one. I want to do it myself. And Columbia Highlights is sort of another good intro tour to Columbia sort of like the Santa Marta's. If you're looking to dip your feet in Columbia, that's a good way to go. Some of these dates may not work for you, but we can always do a tailor-made trip. Uh, more and more we're doing that for folks. Let us know and we'll set it up for you. So yeah, with that, um, that's, my, that's my spiel. And uh, I'd like to invite back Keith and Nikki. Thanks for the time, guys. Oh, well done. Thank you so much, George. And before we go into Q&A, just a quick note to say our GoFundMe link is still up and uh, has been shared in your chat box. So uh, we, we are offering these virtual tours for free of charge. But if you'd like to donate to our guides and uh, NGO partners, the link is there and available. Um, next dream destination webinar, we remain firmly positioned in the world's most prolific birding continent, South America. We invite you to join rock jumper leader Rob Williams as he takes us on another mouth-watering virtual escape through the southern and central regions of Peru, exploring famous sites such as the Manu Road, the Andes, Machu Picchu and more. This region holds an abundance of specials and endemics that are not to be missed. The link for that webinar is also in your chat box if you'd like to register now. And um, over to you guys for Q&A. <laughs> Fantastic. Thanks so much, Nikki. And thank you, George. Wow, that, uh, that, wasn't, that wasn't interesting at all. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Mind-blowing. Wow, wow, wow. I mean, it's certainly a part of the world I've never been to, but uh, geez, uh, incredible, incredible. It was a fun um, trip. Incredible photos. Yeah, such a, such a dive diverse area uh, amazing and i mean that's just one little fragment of columbia as well um sure. great stuff so we'll head into we'll head into some q a now um there's a there's a bunch of questions that have come up um i guess first and foremost let's let's deal with the uh the physical level of the trip i know you did touch on that uh to some degree but um kathleen's asking just about the physical level and also just about the walks as well ricky's just asking as well about uh, how strenuous some of the walks are, and I, and I guess it's very different between the Llanos and uh, and Inirida. But, yeah, the Llanos um, yeah, is maybe. a little, yeah, the, the Llanos is a little more straightforward and sort of normal in that you're, you have days where you're in a vehicle, kind of on safari, and then you have other days where you're more on foot for half the day, but then you, you know, you break for lunch, what have you, and, um, but you can kind of be in and out of vehicle some days, uh, you, at some point, you usually do like a half day float trip along the river. Um, so that is sort of more kind of, I would say, more normal pace. Um, but in, in an area, the, there's not that many roads. Um, and a lot of the birding sites are a little remote. And it, one of the nice things about Inuri, though, is basically all the birding destinations are, you know, 30 minutes away almost, you know, so you're, when you're, once you're at your hotel, you've kind of got short little runs each day and you can see birds anywhere. That was one of the things I really liked about it, but you're out for quite a while. So, you know, once, once you leave in the morning, you're, you know, you're on, often you're on foot until lunch um, and, or maybe you're in, you're in a boat for a little part of that and on foot for most of it. So it's it, the, the hiking is is not dip, the only difficult hike was that um, Tapui that we hiked up. Uh, that was a very difficult hike, but I think most folks could actually probably, even though it's steep, do the first leg of that hike and still get a beautiful view of uh, around there. So you can do sort of a shorter version of that hike. The rest of the walking is 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 flat. You're on trails. There's pl little places where it's uneven, and and you you know you want to have good ankle support and prepare for mud. Um, but it, it's, it's not that difficult. It's more just that you're out for a long time on foot. Uh, so that's something folks would want to keep in mind. 
Excellent. Um, Ricky's just asking as well, I guess it's, it's somewhat tied in, but um, accommodation wise, what's, what's accommodations like in both those sections? Yeah, the, the, the accommodations are, you know, a lot of our destinations we featured here are, you know, really tried and true spots that we've been doing a long time. Uh, tourism to these two spots, and especially birding tourism, is, you know, in an area that it, there's, you know, it's really hardly been done at all. Uh, and in the Llanos, it's been done a little bit. So it, it's not, you know, we're not talking five-star accommodation here. We're, we're talking, you know, I don't want to say basic rustic because it's better than that. Um, but people should be prepared for, you know, cold water showers and which is fine because it's usually hot. Um, people, you know, mostly folks aren't dying for hot, hot water, but, um, you know, it's, it's sort of, it's sort of mid-level um, accommodations if, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Um, we we actually discussed this a little bit beforehand. Some of the differences between Inarida and Me Too, and you know, may, maybe a question is going to come up, and and lo and behold, it has. Um, Alison just asked about: uh, Would you recommend going to Inarida, even if you have been to Me Too? Um, it's one of those. I mean, as as George has mentioned, um, his his first time in Amazonia in this part. Um, if you have any comments, George, you're welcome to. But yeah. Alison, we, we can get back to you with, with a bit more of a detailed uh, answer as well. We can we can chat to some of our guides who have uh, I mean, been I think to a number of times. Yeah, I think it depends on what you've you know how how you did in Me Too because there are some birds like I know folks that have not seen the white naped seed eater in Me Too. Uh, and we, we, we saw it our last day, but we didn't try much prior to that. Black Bushbird is one I know that folks that have been doing near them or to me too several times have not seen. Uh, and we, we were able to find that, um, you know, Orinoco Softtail obviously is a bird that you really can't get elsewhere. This ant shrike, if it proves to be a new species, that's something people will want to go to in Erie the four. So I think between the constellation of birds that are found between the two sites, you, you know, people might find um, they have better luck with some of those in an area though, versus me too. Um, so, uh, so yeah, there's some things that really are much easier in an area though, and, and some things that are possible in both places, but might be a little easier in an area though than in me too. Hmm. Excellent. Thanks for that, George. Uh, Sans just asked here, quick one. Um, is that a yellow headed caracara juvenile with a steer? <laughs> that is, that is, that is, that is a hundred percent accurate. Yeah. And I, I, he, he was hanging around. I, I just, at one point, just kind of watched this guy. I was watching the river and he was hanging out with this, uh, this zebu cattle cow. Uh, you know, he was kind of like looking for bugs running around on the, on the cow. And the, you know, the cow looked not particularly disturbed and maybe even happy to have him there. So yeah, I, I just like this. Nice. nice. <laughs> Thanks for the identification as well, Sven, and, and hello as well. <laughs> Um, George, you've, uh, there's another comment actually here that came in, um, from Susan and Steve, uh, both saying that they just can't wait to see you on the Antarctica trip. Um, so. Awesome. <laughs> nice. Just, yeah. Just, I'm looking forward to seeing you guys as well. There. Yeah. Fantastic. Um, it's a quick one from, uh, let's have a look over here. There's, there's a couple of questions just around. Uh, COVID, I guess, which is not unexpected, and actually getting into Colombia and kind of how that was for you and, and yeah. just how it sort of progressed. I mean, having actually, you know, I mean, a lot of us, I guess, are thinking about traveling now, and but there's still this uncertainty about, well, how do we go about it and what were the restrictions and what was in place? Sure. And so maybe you can, yeah, chat to us about that. Yeah, a bit, well, you know, one of the things I like about Colombia too, right, is that it's a short flight. Um, I flew from Newark, you know, I'm here in Philadelphia. Uh, Chris and I flew from Newark. It was under under six hour flight, and right now we got that flight for under three hundred dollars. Uh, so it's, I mean, that's, I mean, it's very difficult to beat uh, in terms of price and ease. Um, now we, as we, as I think everybody would expect, traveling now is a little weird, right? It's a little different. Um, you know, in Colombia, they're pretty. They're, they're quite stringent about the mask wearing. Really, we, everywhere we went, people were wearing masks. 
And there are a few places like in Bogota where you'd see folks being a little careless, but in the airport, everybody's masked up on, on the planes, everybody's masked up. And in order to get into Colombia, you have to have a negative PCR test within 96 hours. And the same is true, of course, to get back in the United States. So we were tested before leaving and then before departing. Uh, and we were real careful in between and really so was everybody else we were around. Um, and, you know, thankfully where we were going, like I mentioned, in Erie, though, it was pretty much every there, everybody there had been vaccinated and all the restaurants are open air and everything's kind of outdoor anyway. Um, so, you know, from that point, it was, it was relatively easy. But yeah, once you get into Bogota, once you're in international airports, it's a little different. It took a little bit of adjusting, but, you know, it, it, it wasn't that different. Uh, in fact, I would say in Colombia, they're actually more stringent um, than they have been in the US. They, they, have, they have thermometers, like digital thermometers, you know, everywhere, like even in enter drugstores and pharmacies and stuff. Uh, so they take people's temperature just, you know, at all sorts of different points uh, to try to spot people that might be running a fever. Uh, so yeah, I mean, that, that, that was a little bit interesting and not always the most fun thing to be dealing with, right? Like no, nobody in travel really wants to be dealing with that right now, but uh, we, we knew to expect it. And considering everything, we, we thought it was, it was not overly burdensome and, and it worked pretty well. So that rundown, George. Um, Falk, is there, uh, is there, is it true at all that there's uh, any problems resurfacing with Falk? Or is that? Uh, do, do I'm not the best happen? person to ask about this. Yeah. You know, the, the places where we go on tour really aren't affected by that. Um, you know, there's occasionally other issues we have to deal with on, on, some of the places we go, like weather and floods and um, so forth. But the areas where we go on our tours really aren't affected by FARC. There are a couple outposts, I gather, where um, things are sensitive um, and we just don't go to those areas. Um, but as far as their current status, you know, I sort of know a little bit about what I've heard, but I, I don't think I'd be in a strong position to comment on, on any, any sort of resurgence. Um, I think I'd be a little skeptical about it personally. Sure. Thanks for that, uh, George. Um, let's have a look over here. What else? Um, this time of the year, uh, you went in Feb. Um, do you think do you think that's the kind of the best time to get into into this part of the world, or when do the rains normally start? You can really go um, to these places. Both, I would say, are, are optimal kind of January through March. But I, a lot of people go earlier than that. Many birders will go to the Llanos in particular. I mean, we offer trips there in November, December, um, and it's still very good. It's just different, you know. Um, and in some ways, it's, it may be better going then than later. Um, I just like it when it's drier personally. And I, I like the concentrating effect of having the, the watering holes drying up in places. Um, but really, I mean, there's fantastic trips are done there. I think even as early as October towards the end of the rainy season. This year, I think it would have been tricky. You know, obviously with COVID, there really weren't any, any birders mm. traveling to the region. But apparently the rains extended almost into January, which was very unusual in the Llanos. Um, but yeah, I think be best time is January to March, but you can go earlier and still have a very good trip. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Excellent. Um, just coming back quickly to accommodations, um, do they have 24 hour electricity and in general, what are the temperatures like? Hot. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, it, it's hot and humid, uh, in both places, although it cools off at night fairly good, um, so that it's you know pleasant pleasant for sleeping. The hotel in Anira that actually has air conditioners. In the Llanos, there's no air conditioners. But again, um, when we're there, it's so dry that it actually cools off at night pretty good. And every now and then, you actually get a rain that'll cool things off as well. Um, there is 24-hour electricity in both places. Um, the one caveat to that being that you know one night we did get a big storm in an area that came through and knocked out our power for a couple hours but it was restored you know within i think three hours time um so that's kind of the, how that works excellent 
Um, and then just quickly, Douglas is asking about triplets for just the Janos, um, or the separate ones for the Janos and ones for Inerida. Um, I mean, I guess we will have, have those. We'll put together the um, separate ones for the yeah. Janos. And then, I mean, I know we've got separate for, for Janos already. Um, yeah. I don't think we have one for, for Inerida. Yeah. I mean, it's pretty, pretty just, brand I new. ahead of me there to, to, uh, to, to work on that. But, uh, but yeah, the Giannis, we have some good trip reports because we've run a number of trips there in the past. Uh, the next in area, the trip we run will be, um, you know, they'll, those folks will be, they'll have a checklist and all that, but uh, I don't think we, I'm not sure if we quite have it together yet. Uh, I haven't done it. Yeah, any rate. yeah. Yeah. I don't think so. I mean, it was just, yeah. It's so given you just, you just returned from scouting it pretty much. So yeah. <laughs> good stuff. But yeah, we'll work it. We'll work on that Douglas. Um, can get that information across to you as soon as it's available. Um, just moving away from Inarida and the Janos, um, I don't know how much you know about the uh, the triangle hummingbird trip, but uh, any idea off the top of your head how many hummers you can see on that particular tour? I don't know. I don't that know. Is it's enough myself. Yeah, <laughs> it's going to be dozens. Um, yeah, it's going to be it's going to be probably at least several dozen. Uh, maybe even maybe even more than 50. Um, I'm not exactly sure, but I will say a lot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think more yeah, than 50. We can, that, that, <laughs> yeah. that certainly sounds like a few. Uh, but yeah, we can get you a more specific answer as well there, Harold. Um, and then Don's just asking a little bit more about vaccinations and what have you. Um, you know, and this is this is such a moving a moving target as well, and it's all in development. I mean, every week we're seeing things change. But Don's asking about uh, does already having your vaccinations preclude having to have a negative test before and after travel? No, I don't think it does actually, no. um, because my my Kristen, my fiance, had, was fully vaccinated when we went, and she still needed to have one. Um, so I think you still, unless they develop this, you know. Um, vaccination passport, which is, you know, under discussion, um, that might change things. Until then, I think you still have to have the negative PCR test. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, all right. And then one last one. Um, we've got time for another one here. So Polly's asking, if you've traveled quite a bit in South America, uh, which part of Colombia would you recommend for the most endemic birds? That's a good question. I mean, <clears throat> any of our Andes trips will net a good number. Mm. Uh, and I'm actually not sure which one gets the most, but any of the Andes trips or the Santa Marta's trip. Uh, the Santa Marta's trip, I think there's about 30 there and you have got a reasonable chance of 20 or so. Uh, getting them all is pretty tricky and depends how you, you know, there's some that need to be split before they're kind of counted as full species. But stick to the mountains, um, and you'll get a big whack of endemics. That's where, you know, all the, the little micro ranges and ha habitats, and that's where things really, really get species diverse. Yeah, yeah, I agree with you 100%. I think that sort of old, what we used to call our comprehensive trip, which we've cut up into three smaller bite-sized pieces, which are kind of like the Western and Central Andes and the Magdalena Valley, Medellin, those three combined, like George said, with that Santa Marta uh, Mountains extension, I think that's your, your best bet for really um, going big on the endemic birds there, Polly. And hello as well, by the way. <laughs> um, all right, excellent. That's all we've got time for, folks. Thanks so much to everyone for sticking around. So much of you sticking around, um, yeah, for Q&A. George, thank you so much for your time um showing us around that amazing part of colombia um nikki as well i know it's been a long day for a long day for you it's been a long day <laughs> over in mauritius it's getting quite late um but yeah thank you everyone for joining us it's it's been fantastic and uh, we hope to see you again in a couple of weeks time for a bit of peru with rob williams <laughs> all right thanks guys thanks everybody bye, bye everyone